The following program is brought to you by Podcast One Sportsnet. This episode of the Steve Austin Show is sponsored in part by DDP Yoga. A man working countless matches over the years, it ain't no surprise that my body has taken this year of bumps and bruises. And turns out my buddy Diamond Dallas Page knows all about the wear and tear the ring takes on your body, and his DDP Yoga Fitness System was specifically designed to burn fat, reduce pain, and heal from injuries. Dallas is so positive that you'll absolutely love the DDPY program and using the DDPY app that he's doing something he ain't never done before. He's going to give you seven days free to try it out. That's a week to try the program, explore the app, and own your life, and it's completely free. DDP Yoga can work for all ages, weights, and fitness levels. It's a kick-ass cardio workout that will dramatically increase your flexibility and strengthen your core like never before before. All with minimal joint impact. Just for listeners of the Steve Austin Show, you can save 20% off an annual membership for the DDP Yoga Now app off any DVD pack. Just go to ddpyoga.com forward slash Austin to get started. And check this out. DDP is headed back to the UK. It's putting on another DDPY inspiration meets perspiration workshop for one night only. Thursday, April 19th at Frome Sport and Fitness in Somerset, England. Come on over to this incredible three-hour workshop where you'll get to meet DDP, get a kick-ass workout, and hear DDP's secrets to staying motivated. Get your workshop tickets at ddpyogaworkshops.com. If you can't make the workshop, don't worry. You can still catch DDP in person at the Wales Comic Con April 21st and April 22nd. Details and tickets are at WalesComicCon.com. The following program is a PodcastOne.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. All right, everybody, welcome to Steve Austin Show. I am coming to you from the mean streets of Los Angeles, California today. I'm sitting over here at 317 Gimmick Street. Got my podcast table going, laptop, computer, Zoom, H4N, rolling sound. Here we go. Got a damn good show for you, man. I had a good time talking to this guy. I got a phone call. I got a text message the other day from PJ Polacco, also known as Just Incredible. You know him from back in the days at WWF and really a lot down there at ECW. And PJ was always one hell of a worker. And he gave me a lot of my material early in my stone cold days to help that character get over whether it was working a few uh, angles with him inside the ring, cutting promos, or getting a chance to do some color commentary, he was a vital part of the beginnings of the Stone Cold character. I've always gotten along real well with PJ. Uh, We didn't really run in the same circles, but we were always on the same page with respect to the business. He's a good dude. He's a hell of a worker. And, you know, a couple years ago, he came on the podcast and Talked about some of his uh, demons that he picked up uh, along the way, uh, going down the road of the business of professional wrestling and life in general. And it turns out PJ is uh, right now still in the process of making a documentary about his struggles with his addictions, overcoming those, having a relapse, kicking out. And uh, the conversation we're about to have is just shooting a breeze, catching up, talking about that relapse, talking what it took for him to get clean, and just talking about the business of pro wrestling in general. I always like talking to PJ. He's a fun guy to talk to. He's got a very interesting story. I'm looking forward to the credible documentary that they're about to come out with. We're going to get into that and shoot the breeze. A whole lot of fun catching up with PJ and talking about some serious stuff in the process. Man, a dude has uh, really been in some uh, precarious positions as far as you know some of his personal habits that he picked up we're going to talk about that but before we get to pj god dang it man i tell you what i had such a blast over the last week we flew my nephew neil down and my two nieces emma and brandy we flew them down to los angeles and then we headed down to uh nevada went down to stay a couple of days over there and we wanted to stay in nevada a little bit longer than we did Turns out, man, I'm really having to get used to the weather up there in northern Nevada because that snow is a sun bitch. And, man, it was fixing to come snowing down, and my wife gets nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chair. Well, we got to go down that 395 to go through Mammoth and uh, shoot Bridgeport, all those little towns, get ice and snow on the road. We ain't got no chains for our vehicles. Anyway, we had a blast up in Nevada. 
But the good part happened when we got back to the main streets of Los Angeles because me and my nephew Neil had been planning on going to the golf course, but due to the fact that we were trying to show them Nevada, we didn't get a chance to get out on the course. So I'll tell you what, man, me and my nephew Neil got in my Yukon XL and headed down to the LBC to uh, go to the Hoonigan shop over there. And uh, turns out those guys were out filming, but he wanted to go so bad, we tried to make it over there. And no one was there. We got turned away, and we decided to head over to Iron Addict's gym, C.T. Fletcher's gym. Well, C.T. Fletcher wasn't there. He's waiting on a heart to get that heart transplant. And C.T., if you listen to the podcast, man, keep hanging tough. I hope everything goes your way. I hope you get a heart, and I hope everything goes well with you. And I hope one of these days I'm cruising up to the LBC in my 1974 Camaro Z28. We ride around, and you show me the sights and sounds and the scenes of where you grew up. So CT wasn't there. We shot the breeze, took a couple of pictures in the gym. It's a badass gym over there. And then on the way back, we said, hey, man, there's a driving range, a dedicated driving range. There wasn't no golf course. It was just a driving range, one of them kinds with an upper deck and a lower deck. So I said, shit, we're here. Let's go ahead and knock the hell out of some golf balls. I ain't hit a golf ball in probably 10 years. And probably if you counted up all the times I've been to a driving range, I probably hit about, I don't know, 20 buckets of balls in my entire life. I've probably played maybe 10 complete, I don't even know if I've played 10 complete games of golf. So I am a complete effing rookie when it comes down to golf and swinging a club. So anyway, we get to LBC to the uh, driving range there, and of course we get out, and the dude shows up, and he goes, it was almost like going to Wally World. And the moose told Clark W. Griswold and his whole family that the park was shut down for maintenance. Turns out they were doing some maintenance on the god dang golf driving range, and so we got rejected yet again. And I said, well, son of a bitch, man. Are we going to get rejected every time we try to do something? This is flat out ridiculous. I'm on my own turf, the mean streets of Los Angeles and the surrounding areas, and we ain't getting in nowhere. So finally, we went down to a little golf course not too far from the house, and lo and behold, the driving range was open. I ain't got no clubs. Neil didn't bring his clubs from Edna because it's too much of a pain in the ass to put those things on an airplane. So I went down, got a couple of buckets of balls. We borrowed some clubs. He borrowed a couple of irons. All I had was a driver. My specialty is just driving, and I really don't have a specialty because I suck really, really bad. We went out there, man. You go out there, and you kind of get... I don't really give a damn, so I don't get intimidated, but you see some people out there with some really good swings, some really good techniques, just really knocking that ball straight and far and doing everything they want with whatever club that they're using. Guys out there working on their game. And, of course, the golf course is right there next by, and so they're playing golf as well. But me, I'm just trying to get back into the swing of things, no pun intended, just by swinging that driver. So anyway, man, holy cow. My nephew, Neil, was knocking the hell out of that ball. They were going straight, far, different irons, using the different clubs. He's really a damn good golfer, and it was really fun to sit there and hang out with him. Meanwhile, over on my little section of the driving range, I had that damn driver. I loosened up a little bit, swung around the hips, got my, you know, my abdominal muscles loose, got my shoulders loose, swung the club around a little bit, and teed one up. First two I hit went into orbit. I think those two golf balls are still orbiting planet Earth as we speak. I got lucky by drilling the shit out of two of them. From there on, it was downhill. Man, I tell you what, I don't know what what, what I was doing, but I was trying to, uh, you know, I think it's like one of the same things you do with professional wrestling. The number one mistake when you start wrestling is working too fast. Well, the number one thing to me in golf is trying to swing too hard. So I'm out there trying to kill that little damn golf ball with that damn driver. Ain't got no form. And when I swing and you, I missed a couple. I hit some worm burners. 
I hit some that a worm would laugh at. They were rolling so slow. I hooked the shit out of a bunch of them. I sliced a bunch of them. And every now and then, about about one every 15 swings, I'd crush one down the middle. But I still wasn't getting the distance that I wanted. So anyway, that was five days ago. I went down to the uh, sporting goods store and got me a driver. And I'll tell you about my driver store when I talk to Ted Fowler 361 on Thursday. But I got me a driver. After five days of going back to back to back to back, hitting 115 balls at a whack, I'm starting to pick up a little bit of form. Now, I'm sure to any golf pro around the world, my, my swing probably still looks like crap. But at least I'm able to replicate it with some type of consistency trying to keep uh, that left knee in a locked position and trying to just rotate, you know, from the shoulders rather than trying to get all cattywampus because, man, I tell you what, Neil was able to really coach me up from, uh, you know, the ability he's been playing longer than I have and help me out. And when I focus on the things that Neil taught me, man, I'm really hitting them straight down the fairway, well, straight down the driving range, and I'm having a blast doing it. So anyway, I'm taking up golf. Uh, I'll start working with my irons once I kind of just, uh, I want to spend about another week just working with that driver, just swinging the club. And then I'm going to start working through the irons and picking up that. But uh, what I really want to do is get out there and start golfing. But until I have done some type of work behind the irons in the woods, I'm not going to get my ass on a golf course and just get totally embarrassed. I'll work on my swing, build up some consistency. I'm having fun. If I can, I'll pick up a lesson here or there because, believe me, I could use all the help in the damn world. But anyway, i got a golf conversation coming up. I'm talking with Ted Fowler, 361, on the Thursday show. James Ellsworth is coming up, and I'm finally almost through with my Dr. D. David Schultz book. Holy hell, I am the slowest reader on planet Earth, but that's a whole other story for a whole other day. Before we get to my interview with P.J. Polacco, just incredible about his documentary, Incredible, allow me to offer you a solution to a dilemma. Right now, it's basketball season and it's also hockey season. But what if you're a fan of both? How do you watch all the sports? Well, rather than filling your living room with TVs, head on over to Buffalo Wild Wings. They got hockey and they got basketball on, each playing on dozens of screens so that you don't have to choose. And to complete the trifecta, they can ensure you have access to all the sports foods you crave from their selection of America's favorite wings and any of their 21 signature sauces and seasonings to shareable favorites like cheddar cheese curds, fried pickles, and you'll have everything you ever wanted. But wait, they also have a variety of beers to quench your thirst. All the basketball, all the hockey, all the food, and all the beer you want. Buffalo Wild Wings. Wings, beer, sports. Please drink responsibly. Hey, everyone. I'm Wade Keller, and it's WrestleMania season. So be sure to subscribe to the Wade Keller Pro Wrestling Podcast here at Podcast One. I produce two new shows each week. Every Thursday on our flagship show, I'm joined by a co-host from the wrestling journalism field to talk about the hot topics in WWE and elsewhere. Every Friday, I'm joined by a guest who has worked in the wrestling business, including ex-WWE creative team members like Kevin Eck talking about Drew McIntyre. Drew was a young guy, and did it go to his head? And did he walk around like he was the chosen one? He did. And I was frank with him. And I said, Drew, just so you know, this is how they view you. And Podcast One's own Christian Harlaw talking about his days working for WWE and Vince McMahon specifically. As far as the perception of him, I mean, he's the king. He walks in and just you can feel it. I mean, if the force was real, you would feel the force <laughs> it would, powering into the room when he enters. And pro wrestlers, including NWA World Heavyweight Champion Nick Aldis, also known as Magnus, talking about the challenges facing Ronda Rousey as she transitions from MMA to WWE. I'm sure if you ask Rhonda, she'd probably say that this moment is, is the result of hundreds of people's work meticulous preparation and planning and timing and everything. And now suddenly it's like, go. And that can be very overwhelming. Just search Wade Keller on Apple Podcasts or on the Podcast One app or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. This is the Steve Austin Show. All right, I'm Roland Sound at 317 Gimmick Street. I got PJ Pelago on the other end of the line. We're Skyping. I can't see him. He can't see me. But the recording quality ought to be good enough that we ought to be able to conduct a quality conversation. PJ, good morning. How are you today? I'm doing great, Steve. How are you doing today, man? 
outstanding. God dang, I finally got a good night of sleep. Uh, I had my nephew down, a couple of nieces down here, had a great time. They were hanging out for about a week. We finally put them on an airplane to go back to Texas. So now I got my house back. We had an absolute blast, but now I'm back to my old rhythm. And I just picked up, because my nephew is such an avid golfer, he's on a high school golf team. Man, I picked up a driver. I ain't no good at golf, but I picked up a driver. <laughs> for the past three days, we've been going down the range, and I've been trying to knock the hell out of some golf balls. And I either hook them or I slice them. And every now and then, one of them will go straight. And then about five out of ten go about 50 yards or less. So I'm pretty much the drizzling shits. You ever golf before? I actually, you know, it's funny. I really, I really have, and I know what you're saying. And I noticed every time I'm going, I'm, I haven't hit a ball in a couple of years. But when I used to go out, I used to go to the range before I'd hit, because uh, I live in Connecticut, so we got the seasonal thing. So at about, you know, this time of year, I would go out to the range. Uh, I never, never was very serious uh, golfer, but uh, it was cool time, nice time to hang out and stuff out outdoors. And uh, I noticed that every time I tried to put any kind of Umf into the ball, it would slice or hook. And just if I just tried to tap that son of a gun, it would probably go a hundred, if a hundred yards straight. But it's a fair, dude. That could drive you insane. It's a very frustrating, uh, very frustrating gimmick right there. Yeah, I know, but I think you're, you're probably like me. I mean, just because we're, you know, I, I, I man, you know, when I was running with WWF, I consider myself a professional athlete. Probably sure, you did yeah. too, at least a high level yes, athlete. But and certainly someone with my athletic background, track, football, baseball, all that. You know, even though I never played golf and I hadn't swung a club in probably you know ten or twenty years, dude, I still expect to be good. Yes. Yeah. But if you yeah. don't ever play, you're going to suck. And here's the, here's the icing on the cake, and then we'll get to you. <laughs> Sit there and shoot the breeze, but it's good to break your ice with you, man. I, went, I was out there, and my nephew, he's 18 years old. He loves to video everything. So, of course, he had to video a couple of my swings. And, you know, to your point, man, I was going out there, and I was just trying to crank them. When you, when you try to crank them, everything hurts, and the ball doesn't really go that far. And if you just relax and swing through, well, then you're going to have a little bit more success. But whether I was cranking or whether I was trying to use my quote-unquote relaxed swing, right. dude, when I watch that kid <laughs> swing that club, it's a thing of beauty. When I watch myself, my right arm doesn't straighten out because it's crippled because that try set preparing the calcium I got in that joint so it's like a T-Rex out there with a driver and you talk about the shittiest form ever it's absolutely brutal but the bottom oh, line is great. DJ I don't take yeah. myself too serious and with a game as bad as mine is it can only get better there you go, man. There you go. But uh, yeah, it's all that they say. It's it's ironic because it's from the Adam Sandler movie uh, Happy Gilmore. But it is. It's all in the hips. So there you go. You know, it is all in the hips. <laughs> and my well, the thing about it, my nephew's out there, and he'll try to give me some instruction. By the time he gives me you know all the different pieces of instruction, I'm thinking so bad or thinking so hard about every single thing I'm doing. Then I'm you know, dude, when you're thinking, you're stinking. And so yeah, you're all trying to put it all together. So I'm just yep. going out there and I'm. Today I'm going back out. I made a I made a commitment since the uh, driving range ain't too far from my house. I'm always complaining about different things to do in Los Angeles because of the traffic. But this yeah. is an easy commute, so I'm going to stick to it. And uh, next time we talk, maybe I'll be hitting 300 yard drives. There you go. Baby. Then again, maybe yeah. I won't. <laughs> then you won't. May I got to get out there? Period. This year, but uh, hopefully I will. We'll see. Hey man, we'll see. let's uh, let's shift gears and shoot the breeze and yeah. talk about you, man. You 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 shot me a direct message the other day. You said you got a documentary coming out, and yeah. I wanted to talk with you about that. See where you was at, how you doing, what the documentary is all about. Well, I mean, I don't expect people. I'll, I'll shove it down everybody's throat real quick. I don't know how much everybody's in, you know informed, but uh, I went to. Uh, as everybody knows, I've had a history with drug and alcohol, substance abuse um, for a long time. And uh, I got clean off opioids about five, six years ago. I, when we first talked, I think, uh, when we did the podcast a long time ago. Um, but then since then, you know, I felt for some reason, I guess I wasn't real happy with who I was and trying to find uh, a life outside the business um, because, quite frankly, it just wasn't paying the bills. And it was real hard for me mentally. Um, you know, it became a mental health issue. So I started drinking um, at first, not too much, just casual, a beer here, a beer there. And uh, it just snowballed, man. It snowballed into like 750 liters of vodka a day. 
uh, and you mix that up with like Coca-Cola and sugar because I actually hate the taste of booze, believe it or not. I was always a gimmick guy, and I, what people don't understand, I, I like pills. I didn't like uh, booze. So, uh, anyways, I didn't. You know, I thought for some reason, well, I'm not a drinker. I could handle a buzz every now and then, and uh, it appeared for about five years, brother. It snowballed to where I was almost 300 pounds of just pure bloat fat on the verge of death. Um, my liver failing, my calves are. Uh, really just ridiculous. I thought I was going to lose my legs. They were ridiculous. But anyways, uh, so I went for help. I asked uh, WWE's wellness policy. I called a gentleman by the name of Bob Keylarg over there, and uh, they put me in a great place in uh, Tampa, Florida. And uh, and in December, man, I uh, I hit a snag. You know, um, I had a relapse, and, uh, you know, it, it's always an uh, interesting thing, and I guess everything happens for a reason. It happened publicly at a show uh, in Connecticut which uh, kind of made a jerk. I haven't watched the video. I refuse to because I, you know, I can imagine it was pretty embarrassing, but it went viral as everything does these days, you know, everybody, uh, you know, and, uh, but through that, uh, these, this, you know, this guy got a hold of this guy from Connecticut. His name's Douglas Cartelli and uh, David Gear. They both uh, are in the movie business. David actually produces a bunch of movies uh, that a lot of our friends have been in. Um, and they, brought me together with Paige to uh to put together a, a documentary basically uh you know about the journey of me getting back on track with my life and uh, it's it's really interesting because you know it's we're not trying to make a movie about wrestling I mean that's been done we didn't want to do a Jake documentary too because I'm you know I'm not Jake a eh? but it's a human story it's like um I think I mean I'm like Mickey Rourke in the wrestler really uh I got a regular job you know I work for this guy's concrete company now um you know and I take my indie bookings if I can get them, whatever, you know, but uh, it's just a real humbling uh, journey. We're still in production. Um, and you know, we don't know where it's going to end up. There's no, uh, big, uh, finish line kind of deal. We have some ideas, uh, but, uh, really we just keep the cameras on. I have a camera that I keep on the house, which is really kind of weird, um, to have people at first you think, well, it's all a gimmick. Uh, you know, you pick up shots here or there, but you know, you get some really, uh, ugly things, uh, that go on that you don't want to, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's been a hell of an experience, hopefully a good one for me because, you know, it'll, uh, just, I don't know, man, be good for people in my situation because so many people suffer from substance abuse these days, man. It's a real big topic and issue. And if, uh, you know, I'm sober today, man. It's going to be uh, 90 days and uh, two weeks. And I don't like to say that because you're supposed to say the one day at a time thing. But, uh, man, we'll we'll see. But that's really what the principle of this whole thing is, man. You know, and it, that's it. How long did it take you guys film this thing? Oh, uh, we're, we're still going, man. It started. Uh, Dallas called me, DDP, and I actually talked to him yesterday. He was on his way out to your neck of the woods there out in L.A. Um, he's in the airport uh, handing out gimmicks for his uh, yoga. He's unbelievable. DDP yoga, man. He's always a hell of a salesman. He's always pushing his thing. And it's, it's really an incredible thing. I, I do it. And that's part of the journey in this film. Uh, it's not exclusively part of it, but it's one of the pieces of it. But, uh, you know, it's um, it really is. We're looking for something uh, like a finishing point, really, like to see where, if my life can change, maybe we get something to where, um, you know, I go through that curtain one more time back to being someone of myself. I mean, I, we really don't know. There's no end game, which is really difficult. You know, you, you end up with a bunch of footage. And it's real hard to dissect of what the narrative is, what the story, you know, what you're trying to bookend, you know. Um, so it's really up in the air at this point, but uh, there definitely is, uh, you know, they got Netflix in this and uh, iTunes and all kinds of distribution. So, uh, you know, we'll see. We'll definitely see. And that's up to those guys. But uh, we'll be shooting all the way up until, uh, you know, they probably late spring, uh, from what I understand. Yeah, but you know what? DDP and Steve U and the whole gang over there, they do a tremendous job. And I've seen different cuts of the, the Jake the Snake thing from its inception and the different versions until the final version. And I tell you what, man, Dallas really has turned, and him and Steve and that whole team have really turned into great storytellers and capturing everything, the heart of the matter. 
and you know the highs and lows and everything that goes with it so man i tell you what you know i remember when i first came to la i was living with ddp there for about a year give or take i mean it was like the odd couple i was a slob he was a neat freak and he was always down there you know working on his yeah. yoga system and you know all these years later that this guy still has the drive and going back to what you said a while ago a lot of people just kind of get lost once they get out of the business and you know it sounds like for a while you were one of those guys but dallas has been able to maintain focus maintain his drive and his dream and it's just a testament to that positively page thing. I mean, that that's who that guy is, and he works his ass off. And, you know, he, I tell people he really does. back in the day, I mean, you know, to, to this day, Dallas is one of my best friends, and he's one of the hardest working guys I know. But going back to you, when let, let, let's talk for a second, let, and let's catch back up, because, hell, I've been hitting the head with so many steel chairs, PJ, and that podcast we did was a while back. Sure. But so so what was the demons before the alcohol, what, what was the basic thing that threw you off that you got into man uh it was it was really pain pills uh that started um you know it started with uh i never even had a doctor and i, I don't like to talk too much you know in detail but i'll just mention that you know everybody knew it was like the wild west back in the uh in the early early to mid 90s you know 100%. and uh you know, you can get a gimmick here, gimmick there from anybody. Um, so it just started, you know, 30 days straight on the road sometimes, hitting those small shots. I was a young kid coming up um, trying to make it in the business. And, you know, how insecure things were back then. So, you know, you couldn't complain. And I wanted to fit in. I was a young man in a big man's game. Um, you know, a lot of my idols and heroes I'm now in the business with. And, you know, you don't want to seem like that. You know, it was a, lot, it was a bunch of peer pressure, but also the combination of – doing it just to do it because you needed to get out there or else somebody else would pick that uh take your spot real quick so uh it started with the pain pills then when ecw came around it uh oxycontin started to come out you know and that became a real big thing and it got it was just everywhere um again you know i did really had a doctor and uh and unfortunately it carried over to when I went back to WWE uh, for my run with X-Pac uh, for that tag team there for a cup of coffee, a couple of years. And, um, and then when I really kind of didn't have any employment, and I hate to say it's pretty embarrassing, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. Uh, when the money ran dry, I went to Ivy Heroin because it was cheaper. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's very disgusting to say, you know, I have kids 18, 14 and 11. Uh, to put that out there, but uh, you know that's uh, that's a tale of a lot of kids these days. A whole lot of people, I shouldn't say kids, uh, men and women. Um, you know, they start off innocently enough through their doctors. You hear the story a thousand times. They get hooked on this stuff, and uh, it takes a real ugly turn. Uh, Suboxone saved my life, actually, and uh, you know the wellness program the first time around saved my life, and um, you know that got me good. But uh, you know, booze is booze is so hard, man. Not to give it a uh, you know whatever but it, it's so hard because it's so culturally available like i was at my daughter's christening thursday man and everybody's kicking back at the after party uh you know having a cocktail having a glass of wine and i know i can't have that one in it but you know what i mean because for me it's a torturous thing it's like hell why well, have one when i can have two or three and feel that feeling and unfortunately i know i can't i can't i don't have that control and uh it's just a, it's just a it's one of those things man and it, it kind of sucks you know but uh I'm grateful. I'm grateful to just be here, dude. I really am. Hey, to the point you just made there, you talk about the peer pressure coming up in the business of pro wrestling because it's interesting because it's not like you got a bunch of guys saying, "Hey, man, try this." Hey, man, you you got to eat one of these. It's right. just the fact that you're around so many guys that that are doing it, and so you know, it, maybe it's a way to fit in. It's not like people are just banging on your door saying, hey, man, PJ or Steve, eat this, no. eat this. It's just, hey, man, you just kind of fall into the groove. Sometimes yes. you're really in pain. It's just what everybody, or, I mean, I, I'm not going to say everybody else. It's what a lot of guys are doing. So you just kind of do it to fit in. Yeah, and, you know, and, and I should I should have been a little more careful the words I chose, but you did. I wanted to fit in, you know, and uh, I went above and beyond to try because I was. I was a young, impressionable kid, really not well-schooled, in the world uh, at that age I was 19, 20 years old I didn't think anything of it heck I have a hell of a story when I went on my first vacation um, made a little money with my wife and my first son and uh, she said PJ do you need me to uh, refill your Vicodin I said well honey no I'm not wrestling so I don't need it right <laughs> 
And uh, I got down to, to New Jersey. We were on the shore. Uh, anyways, going to the beach like areas and stuff. And, uh, you know, get to the hotel and I started to sweat and feel, you know, and I was like, what's wrong with the room? Is it too hot? It's too cold. Maybe the bed's uncomfortable. <laughs> and then I start crying for no reason. Days go on. And, you know, and then it's like, and then I finally called my doctor and he called it in for me uh, over, you know, over here in Jersey. And I was like, well, wow, that's physical. Uh, that's what's physical withdrawal. But I was that stupid and naive, you know what I'm saying? To not even uh, really get it. Or, you know, life was just such a fast forensic pace for me that I was, you know, I was just oblivious to it, man. And there's no excuse for ignorance. But at that time, and that was the game I was playing. But to go through those physical and mental withdrawals, dude, how many were you taking at the time? And did you realize, it was, oh. obviously you didn't realize there's a problem, but how many were you taking at the time? Because, I mean, it sounds like you were a pretty good amount to have that kind of reaction. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was taking five, six at a clip, um, four times a day at least. Oh, yeah, you know, spot. yeah, yeah. And it, what, what kills you, too, is all that Tylenol and, and stuff. You know, I mean, that's a when people say that they're like, you know, are you kidding me? But no, that was unfortunately what it does build up to to get that. I'd love to get up in the morning. You know, people would think, you know, people sometimes think um, that, you know, you take it and you get it's not like um, muscle relaxers or benzodiazepines and, you know, that put you to sleep. Like I'd wake up, I'd pop five or six, have a cup of coffee. Be ready to train, go, you know, run a marathon and fix the world. Run through a brick wall. Right. Fix the world's problems, you know. But uh, like I said, man, it just, uh, it just, wow. You know, Brian James um, over for Road Dog uh, over at uh, WWE, we talk via Twitter, you know, like DMs and stuff. Uh, unfortunately, you know, he's a busy cat, but he's really been that guy for me in this, you know, because we, um, you know, there's a lot of good people in recovery. And it's amazing the kind of people that you do meet. Uh, um, but somebody that's been through your journey and uh, has that same, you know, been through what we've been through, because we do have a unique experience. It's not like any other job in the world. Um, and it's just relatable. And he's been a really, uh, a really awesome guy. And, and he's amazing the, the way he's turned his life around because Brian was uh, Brian used to run pretty hard, too. And, uh, you know, I'm so proud of him. And he's really a uh, him and Sean Walton, too, man. They've helped. Uh, you know, they're always there. You are right. Uh, you know, you know, if I can give him a call and, you know, put him on speakerphone and, you know, just shoot the shit and help me out if I, if I need it. And sometimes it sounds corny, but you do, you need somebody to just tell you, Hey, you know, it'll be all right. Yeah. I ain't tough. Keep weathering the storm. But, but when it comes from someone who's been there, did that, it means something. It, it does. And especially those guys too. And they know me a little bit too. And, uh, you know, and, I, and it, it's great because I do look up to a lot of those guys. Um, and sometimes I feel like I'm in an Island on my own. And I guess I do that to myself. I always did. I always felt uh, in the business for some reason I was on the outside looking in. And I talked about this with Booker T the other day. I mentioned, you know, he was a big fan of mine in ECW, which I thought was cool, but rare because you don't hear that from the boys admitting that stuff, you know, which was neat. You know, not everybody saw ECW. And I was like, well, when I went back to WWE, I was still Aldo. All that main event and pay-per-views in ECW and doing what we did there as cool as it was for three and a half years, being on top meant nothing because when I walked back in those doors... I was still that kid. Uh, nobody made me feel that way, but emotionally, as a man, as a professional, I wasn't ready yet to, in my mind, you know what I mean, to take that, how Vince likes to say, that brass ring thing. Yeah. I, I still was Aldo. Uh, you know what I mean? I was still in my heart, and I, I didn't play the just, you know, I wasn't just incredible in that ECW locker room that commanded respect. And you know how that is, Steve. That's a big deal, how you present yourself as a businessman in wrestling. Uh, I wasn't that guy. I was a totally different cat. And uh, I, I fell back into being that young kid again out of respect because I did respect the boys and the business so much that sometimes to a fault um, and I'd let people take advantage, uh, quite frankly, you know? Yeah, but you beat yourself up a little bit uh, sometimes, uh, PJ. Have you ever been diagnosed with uh, depression or... I have, I have, I have, yeah. And, it's something I, and I think that's a big reason why... Uh, why I self-medicated, you know, and it's something I work on. Uh, like I said, you know, with Dallas and he's, he's such a super positive dude. And, um, you know, he helps me through those things. I mean, I don't call him and, uh, and get in the, into, you know, complaining about stuff. He'll just get me motivated and he works really good like that. Cause he wants to, uh, I mean, we're going down to Atlanta in a little bit here, uh, to film some of this stuff. And, you know, uh, he wants to certify me to do some of his DDP yoga on the road, you know, uh, to help, you know, because it really does help me 
personally, physically, and, uh, you know, it, mentally, too, it does something to you. I don't know what it is. I think it has a lot to do with breathing and uh, the whole positive vibe thing. But, uh, yeah, I have been uh, diagnosed with depression, and uh, it's good to be around. I, I tend to isolate a lot, Steve, and uh, the more I talk, the more I open up, you know, um, the easier it is for me. You know, it, it's like you feel like uh, you're not all alone. And it sounds weird. You know, it's not like, you're, you know, in, in a tough man, alpha male world you feel weird asking for help or being vulnerable sometimes. And sometimes it can be misinterpreted. So I've always been a little shy about that. You know, you taking any medication for that? No, no, believe it or not, I don't. It's just something they, uh, you're cognizant of and you fight through when you hit the gray areas and, and try to kick out because sometimes, you know, the gray areas last a little while and all of a sudden, boom, you're out of it and back into a gray area. But then sometimes you're just riding fine for a pretty good while. It's, it's, it seems yeah. to me. Yeah, it's it's and that's exactly right. And uh, it's something that I, I've actually asked about medication, and uh, I actually see a psychiatrist, and uh, he's you know the guy that uh, prescribes my Suboxone because I'll probably unfortunately uh, beyond that for my opiate uh, addiction probably for the rest of my life. I take a very small dose, but I'll probably be on that for a long time if not ever. And he I suggested, well, is there anything that I could you know that might help me? He goes as long as you I don't feel you have a chemical thing. I think it's more of your day-to-day -day rituals and routines. And uh, I do find that if I stay busy, if I have a purpose, that's my whole thing is I banked so much and I'm not blaming anything on anybody, but I banked so much of my life on the business. And unfortunately, it doesn't work out always for everybody. And I didn't know what to expect. And we really hit a period of, uh, you know, I thought I'd be working right now, for example, at 44. Um, still physically okay, thank, thank the good Lord. Um, business changed in 2001 to where it's never been in, you know what I mean? And the whole game changed. And for me, I didn't know how to, as an adult, uh, work through that. You know what I mean? I, it was, it's a me problem. It's not a, the anything problem. It's a me problem. But I, I wasn't mature enough to work that out because I was so passionate about wrestling. And I thought I could do it at some level um, for a little longer. And I just wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to give it up. And unfortunately, like a lot of us cats, I live uh, like Mickey Rourke in The Wrestler. I live in the past, man. You know, I live hey, in the man, past. Let me ask you a question about the Suboxone. That, that's, yeah. that's, you know, is that like Ativan? Like if you drink alcohol, it's going to mess you up or make you violently ill or what is that it, it is a, uh, a gimmick where it basically if you use an opiate it would it blocks it Copy. it helps you with cravings and so forth but it also helps you with uh your you know your withdrawal symptoms and something it does with and I, i'm doing a crappy job of explaining but i'll try like the dopamine you know because you really uh when you're on uh opiates for so long it really messes with your brain chemistry so what it does is it helps put some of that dopamine in your brain uh almost like a synthetic uh opioid so it really kind of helps you stabilize your mood kills your cravings and if i was to take a pain pill it just wouldn't work. I wouldn't get sick, Steve, like an abuse for alcohol, um, but I wouldn't feel it. You know, I could take a handful of pills and it would just not work with the blocking agent. So, uh, you know, I do. I take it now, not even because I do have the cravings. I don't. Uh, it's more of a booze thing for me. I crave booze all the time. And I wanted I, hell. I wanted to drink last night. I wanted to drink today. You know, that's no bullshit. But, you know, hell, you got to work through that. Hey, let me ask you a question. And maybe Ativan wasn't the right drug I named because I'm sitting there looking at my computer. It says it's like uh, kind of like a Xanax or whatever. But yeah, I, yeah, I think yeah, you yeah. know what I'm talking about. But here's a question. And abuse. Yeah. Well, yeah, and abuse. So when you were talking to your wife and y'all were going to go on a trip a while, back and she says hey pj you want me to call in your viking and you go no i'm not wrestling i'll be good are you still that, that's your wife you're with currently right oh yeah yeah Okay, yeah. so let me oh. ask you. She knew that you needed those Vicodins because she knew how oh, many yeah. you're going through. So how has oh, yeah. it been for her to deal with your issues? How long have you guys been together? And, and, and what's, what's our thoughts on this? I mean, because that's got to be tough on a marriage. Oh, brother, it's it's huge tough. We've been together for 23 years now oh, of marriage. God. Congrats. <laughs> yeah, man. And uh, she's gone through the – and this is, this is a bigger story that I really don't share much because it's her journey. But uh, she had an opioid problem and an alcohol problem as well. Well, 
So we were kind of fighting, you know, the battle together, which is really not a good thing. Uh, if you think about it for her own sanity and stuff, you know, because uh, I'm having a bad day. It's real easy to tap her on the side and be the devil and be like, hey, babe, you want to get a couple of drinks? Nobody's going to know. Right. You know, or man. vice versa or vice versa. So, yeah, man, it's been uh, oh, full disclosure. Yeah, she's she's you know, and I don't like to talk about her stuff out there that publicly, but it's the truth. Uh, you know, and she'd admit it, uh, you know, but she's not, it doesn't have that public uh, thing, but, uh, yeah, dude, it's been, uh, it's been a real hard freaking journey and just to hold the family down. Um, it, it's been rough. I mean, it's, it's what it is. Uh, we're in a good place today, but, uh, you know, I almost lost her actually last year to a seizure when I was in treatment. Um, I got a phone call, um, when I was inpatient in Tampa that she had seized because she unfortunately didn't have the help that I had with WWE and we didn't have the money and she tried to cold Turkey, the alcohol, mm. um, and, uh, she seized and, uh, she didn't breathe for a while. And, uh, luckily, you know, she got, uh, into a hospital and, uh, you know, my mom and dad took care of that. And, you know, I, I stayed inpatient cause I knew, I really, you know, I didn't know what to do, but they told me to stay, you know, how that goes it's sometimes, uh, that's a bitter pill to swallow, but yeah. So uh, it's been a hell of a journey, man. It's hey, man, really take, take me through the process. You make the call to WWE. They respond. They've, they've had that policy going for a while. I give them a lot of uh, props and respect for doing that for a lot of guys and girls. So yeah. you, you call them. They set you up. You, got it. you go down to Florida. How long is that process? What is the process? What is it that they teach you or help you do to get you off everything that you're on? It's uh, it, it's exactly that, Ben. You you call the you call the office, you know, in talent relations, and they set you up with this gentleman. His name's Bob Keylard, who's uh, somebody who's in recovery himself. He's a alcoholic, you know, recovering alcoholic, of course, uh, twenty some years sobriety. And there's actually a network of people, uh, former men and women, uh, in the WWE that are part of the network that also or your support team, but they'll sit you in a facility. A lot of times they need, you know, depending on what you use and what your drug of choice is, or if it's alcohol, whatever, there's a medical protocol that you go through, uh, whether it's a detoxification program, or, you know, whatever you need. And, uh, man, they just teach you. It's amazing. Uh, the life skills or lack of, because it's a full-time job to be an addict and, uh, it's stop. you know, drugs are great, man. And they, they're really great until they stop being great. and They turn on you. You know, they really do turn on you to where it's not fun anymore. It becomes, oh, uh, you know, you're forging prescriptions. I've been arrested for that. And not a lot of people know about that. And so I don't even know why I'm saying it. But anyways, I've done a lot of shady stuff and uh, it becomes a full time job. So it's uh, you just learn to deal with your emotions, man. And it becomes, you know, in this macho world, it's hard for guys. I mean, I've had guys, well, you know, big names in this business crying in my arms uh, with regret, guilt, shame. So much shame goes into it because we want to hide with this stuff. We don't want to tell, our, you know, our, our friends, our comrades or people that we look up to look up to us and, and, and show our most vulnerable weaknesses and uh it's just it's crazy but they teach you how to manage all that as best you can and to really um it's an everyday process you know and i, I don't like to be that preachy guy because nobody likes to hear that and especially me i sound like a bad rib when i do fail if i do fail and do stumble so it's like a big thing putting it out there like i do it's almost like an accountability thing because believe me i've had this happen where i went to the liquor store trying to get myself something to drink and somebody after one of my relapses said hey man don't you don't need that and it's i was kind of pissed off i was like dude who the hell are you but then like well i'm putting it out there so that's on me publicly you know so it's uh it's a weird thing man but in that way you know it's almost surreal sometimes but it makes the fight a little better for me how long would you, you know? stay down there in the florida treatment center uh 30 days 30 days inpatient they offered me to stay longer um and uh as long as it takes everybody's different um and i would have i would have stayed longer but with my wife jill having uh the issues the health issues that she had um just taking care of kids all by herself was not a good idea so unfortunately i had to come home i didn't come home early i graduated the program but uh, i went right in and again wwe paid for me to go to therapy right away right off the bat after care and so, uh they yeah so when the you go time. in there they take inventory they take a list hey man well, you gotta let you gotta name all the drugs you're taking whether it's prescription for blood pressure this that or whatever yeah. they, they want to know what your addiction is so you, you roll in there do they put you on a dose of something else to help you start coming off that to detox what's the process oh, yeah. 
Oh yeah. And, uh, literally I was, I was in such bad shape because if I didn't have a drink every three hours, I was shaking bad and I get, I'd have the dry heaves, you know, my body was starting to reject it. And, uh, they literally from the airport to the facility, the driver actually asked me before we get you there, you know, do you want to stop and get something to drink so you don't like, you know what I'm saying? You right. know, seize or something like that. And I'm like, no, I think I could handle it. I got right in there, man. I rolled in and, uh, they took good care of me. They put me on, uh, whatever they, you know, that, um, I guess they're, uh, benzo style, uh, you know, anti, uh, convulsion drugs and, and anxiety stuff to kind of level you off from the shakes and the DTs, uh, nausea stuff and all kinds of, of stuff like that. And one of the good things was too, because now I'm also on Suboxone. So they, they were one of the only facilities that would dose me with Suboxone at the same time they were dosing me to get off of the liquor as well, which is very rare. A lot of places won't do that. So they had a heck of a time finding a place. That's why they use this one place in Tampa. Um, that's really actually, they do extraordinary work on there. A lot of the, a lot of guys have gone through uh, that place, but, uh, yeah. So uh, they take inventory, man. And they just, you know, for the first couple of weeks, it's rough though, Steve. Ooh, yeah. But are you, are you, I'm not imagining you sleep for probably about a week going in there. Oh yeah. At least, at least, I mean, you go in there, man, everybody that goes in there is so beat up. I don't remember walking through the door, taking inventory. You know, wow. uh, I, I, I really don't. Um, and it gotten so bad that I didn't make it on the plane the first night. Uh, you know, Bob Keelar, Scott Hall actually called and he was like, you know, you know, Scott, he's, you know, sometimes overboard. He's all, I'll go up there and bring him down, you know, like all, I'm sure you will, dude. But, you know, he was calling me and I missed the flight because, you know, I didn't want to be sick and I'm trying to time things to get over to take this three and a half, four hour flight all kind of logistics. And then I didn't, I was too drunk to get on the plane. And then I could, you know, it was, a, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I really would. not And it's embarrassing to say, but it's all true. And it's part of, of what, it, what happened, you know? And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of cool, uh, in a way to get it out because sometimes you live with this stuff. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's weird. It's kind of, not, you know, and that's why I guess, you know, again, it's, and I'm not doing a shameless plug, but this documentary really will show. And, and unfortunately we didn't get a lot of that, but a lot of the story will be told through it through sit down stuff like we're doing now. But, um, yeah, man, it's, uh, it's heavy stuff, man. I really, I was on the verge. I mean, I was having bloody noses. Uh, my liver was legitimately failing. My blood pressure was through the roof. You wouldn't have recognized me. I was 300 pounds and I'm a little guy. You know, I'm not huge, you know, or when you go into a place like that, do you socialize with anybody else? Or are, you, are you trying to you know, yeah. make, make friends or it's like hey man that's cafe if i just want to be by myself let me try to go through the process and let me get the hell out of here what what, what were you what, what was your mo there um i did actually try to uh, make friends um it was really cool they had uh they had us in this little village and um each play each it's literally a set of condos in the middle of uh this complex they have uh and it's neat and they got three you know the girl side the guy side they got three good dudes to a room um upstairs was a gentleman uh, who was been there for a couple months for, for alcohol who actually was the medical doctor the team doctor for the boston red sox um and it was a real big deal he was a surgeon uh you know, real big deal surgeon. And, uh, of course I can't say names, but there was actually one of the boys was down there as well at the time, you know? So it was really, uh, it was kind of cool, but at the same, it was cool because you know somebody, but it's also kind of like, wow, yeah. you know, that's almost like too much information. You know, it's too much at that time. You look back and you're glad that they were there. But at first it's like, wow, what did I just get myself into? You know, cause you're really at the most vulnerable, you know, you don't know whether you're coming or going, you know? So yeah, it was, uh, but I tried to fit in and, uh, I just, Man, I just did what I was. I surrendered, dude. I did what I was told, and um, that's pretty much all I could do at that point, man. Are they rough. educating you? Are they help, what are they helping you deal with? Are there scare tactics? Are they showing you a bunch of crazy pictures of people all just messed up? No, I mean, no. what is it? No, man, it's it's pretty much saying, look, uh, you know, here's what's happened to people in the past, kind of. And it, I guess you can't say in some ways it is scare tactics, but it's like, look, you know. Um, for something like substance abuse that's been going on for so many years, we really don't have the best science available. And a lot of people knock AA because really it's a non-scientific thing. And, uh, you know, a lot of times they, uh, they hear the word spiritual and people get freaked out, you know, cause you know, right. that, that nowadays it's a little touchy subject, uh, but there's no denomination to it, but they really just tell you, look, man, people, we're not telling you how to live, but alcoholics and drug addicts usually end up, you know, in an institution like this, in jail or dead, 
I went through all of it. I've been in institutions, I've been in jail, and I was on the verge of dying. So basically, they give you the tools to kind of get your head right, wrap your head around, you know, some happiness. Like what, you know, like kind of find what is, what makes you tick? Because I didn't know what made me tick, right. what made me really happy. I mean, and it sounds really, you know, kind of corny for God, you know, again, the stigma of the tough guy uh, in the business. But I was never that tough anyway. <laughs> but it's not the point. But you know what I'm saying. Uh, but really to get in touch with what makes you happy, what makes you tick. You know, uh, shit, I, I, I did all this to my family, did all this to my wife, to my, to my friends, to people I care about. So there's a lot of that guilt and, and anger and shame, you know, because you deep down inside, we're, you know, I think we're all honest, good people that don't want to, at least I am, I don't want to hurt nobody, but I ended up hurting a lot of people closest to me out of, out of all of this, you know, through this process, you know, um, so especially my children. So you sit there and you're really looking back through, through what you've done. And it's almost like making good with looking at yourself in the mirror, being able to say, look, I did these things, face it, own it and move forward and try to put it in the past. And they give you the tools to move forward and, and be a better man in the future, I guess. I mean, it's, it's pretty, you know, it sounds basic and cliche, but, uh, it really is, man. It makes you able to live with yourself without you know hitting the bottle or hitting a gimmick you know because i was very unhappy all right let's take a quick pause for the calls and give big ups to true car now if you're looking to buy a car you're probably familiar with terms like msrp you might even know what it stands for but what does it actually mean the same goes for invoice list price and dealer price it's enough to confuse anybody all you're really looking for is a price that actually means something introducing true price from true car now you can know exactly what you'll pay for the car you want including fees and accessories before you even get to the dealership true car dealers will show you the true price on cars like the one you want all from the comfort of home and how do you know if your true price is a great price because true car shows you what other people paid for the same car you you want and your certified dealers know this so they set their true price competitively so they can win your business so when you're ready to buy a new or used car visit true car to enjoy a more confident car buying experience some features not available in all states you're also going to need car insurance for that new vehicle go to geico.com and in 15 minutes you could be saving 15 percent or more on car insurance that's right save hundreds of dollars on car insurance at geico.com extra money in your pocket it may just be the most rewarding thing you do today hey guys it's mma fighter chael son and check out my podcast you're welcome with chael son and every wednesday and friday right here at podcast one we cover the latest in mixed martial arts and everything else going on in the sports world you can listen free to your welcome with chael son and exclusively on Apple Podcasts, PodcastOne.com, and the Podcast One app. If you love the show, share it with a friend and leave us a comment and a rating review. All right, before we get to the rest of my interview with PJ Palaco, just incredible, here are some words from our sponsor. Flap, Pustule, Jowls, Nugget, Gurgle, Smear, Curd, Bulbous, Tender, Dongle, pork, moist. Now, whether you're a construction worker, warehouse worker, or even a podcast host, if you hear certain words on a job site, it can make work uncomfortable. So at least get work gear that is comfortable. Timberland Pro, work shirts, pants, and boots. Head to toe, Timberland Pro, not uncomfortable. This is the Steve Austin Show. You were always a gimmick guy, as you said a few minutes yeah. ago, and then all of a sudden yeah. you started gravitating towards the alcohol. Myself, I was more of an alcohol guy who dabbled with the gimmicks. So, you know, my bigger issue would have been alcohol. So as you as you decided, okay, ease off these pills a little bit, get into get into some alcohol, why pick the vodka? Well, there, there's many different things out there. You went the sure. vodka route. Uh, it didn't start that way right away. It started with, all right, you know, let's do, a, you know, a couple beers, right? You know, I'd go down there, get some, uh, you know, I was broke at the time. I mean, this is after I wasn't working, so I'd get some Natty Ice, you know, good fun. 5.5 per volume drink a six pack of those but uh you know as your tolerance starts to build and you know you're not getting what you, the buzz you want you're starting to get that heaviness and that bloat it's like well maybe i'll just get a little bit of vodka and mix it with some soda because i don't like the 
you know, the flow, the taste of vodka, quite frankly. Um, so I'd start hitting it. And of course I wouldn't do diet cause I don't, it just became a mess. And there's, you know, you just, I was looking for the effect. I was just looking, right. I wasn't drinking, I wasn't drinking to enjoy it in my head. I was trying to say I was, but really deep down inside, I wasn't, I was drinking to get messed up, you know, and I would drink, I was a morning drinker. I'd get up first thing in the morning. Um, you know, I'd have a bottle with me at all times, you know, it's embarrassing. It's really, uh, it was one of the lowest things, man, you know, cause it is so available. Like I'd, I'd get off a plane over here in Hartford. I'd have a guy, uh, a place where I would literally get my bags from the, you know, the carousel there and go over and, uh, you know, dump out half a bottle of cranberry juice and fill it up with vodka. And I know I'm, it sounds like it is a deadly thing in the, the game I played that I shouldn't have. Then I drive home drinking that thing the whole time, you know? Uh, and yeah, I'm a scumbag for doing that. And that could have hurt somebody, um, you know, killed somebody, uh, you know, just real, real reckless, dangerous stuff. And, you know, and just horrible. I was, I was 24 seven though. It was what bad. was hardest to quit? What, what was it? The, the booze or the pills? The booze, man. The booze was hardest, Steve, because when I cut myself off, like, uh, when I was doing the pills and the dope, um, basically I, I cut off everything, you know, they, I did what they told me to do in rehab. So get your cell phone, throw it out, all those numbers, throw them out. See, I never like, you know, people think nowadays, you know, there's no, you don't go on a street corner and cop drugs. It was like Domino's pizza. I'd get on my cell phone, call the guy 15 minutes. I had the money he'd be at my house. I'd just walk out in my slippers. You know what I'm saying? It's not like I was on a street corner getting, uh, you know what I mean? Gimmicks. <laughs> So it was real easy. So I just uh, threw that. It wasn't easy, but it was easy for me to get. When I got rid of the numbers, it made it more of a challenge if I wanted to partake. It made me put me into dangerous situations. So that was easier. Booze, you go to any place, man, any corner. You go out to lunch. You know, right where I go grocery shopping, there's the, the package store I would go to on a daily basis as all these reminders and these triggers. And uh, and it, it becomes about being honest with yourself because you're like, dude, nobody's going to know if I walk in here and just get a little nipper, you know. But that nip never turned into one nip. Turns into, you know, two or three or four or five. And, you know, then I end up in jail somewhere, you know. But, PJ, <laughs> when you first started taking those, when you first started on the painkillers and all that stuff and it got too expensive or they were too hard to get and so you decided to go with the IV heroin. Dude, yeah. what, what is running through your mind? Because I'll equate this into a wrestling analogy and it may be a bad one. But it's like, okay, hey, kid, we need you to get color tonight. So you're making your first blade. You've never gotten color. No one teaches you how to get color. There you are, dragging a blade across your head all yep. of a sudden you're going from painkillers you're going to shoot up for the first time i don't i mean was someone there to w yep. walk you through the process how did that go down because dude out of all of the things i've done that's all one right. of the things that i've never done it frightens the shit out of me so what yeah. was that like yeah and, it, and the same thing here dude i was painfully scared of needles but i was more scared here was the deal and it was i remember it like it was yesterday and this was t maybe 10 years ago I could only, uh, my wife was getting high too, and we only had enough money for two bags of dope. At the time, we were sniffing it, um, you know, like you sniff pills because we'd never shot up before. But you, we needed a couple of bags, bags, a little amount. It's probably one bag would equate to one pill. Let me let, let relate that to the listeners that don't know what it's about. Um, so then we came down to, well, if we each have one bag and snort it, we're not going to, we're still going to feel sick. It's not going to get us fixed. As they say, you're still going to be sick going through physical withdrawals. So, uh, the guy that got it for me, I said, brother, you know, what, you know, could you just do it for us? And, uh, pretty much, you know, mixed it up, do and, and did it for me for the first time. And, uh, you know, and that was, uh, again, it was a money thing. It, it came down to, I didn't want to be sick, that horrible withdrawal sick. And it just escalated from that to, you know, I think that's what you're trying to get at to how do you get to that level? And he did it for me the first time. And uh, then, uh, you know, it's amazing what you will do to not be sick. Cause that's, after a while, you're not even feet, you're not even getting high. You're just getting well, you know, and uh, it's really, it's a crazy, uh, crazy vicious cycle. How often are you having to, were you having to shoot up every day? And how long does that last? Sure. Um, man, uh, probably every four or five hours. Yeah. Every four or five hours. And uh, again, it wasn't, uh, that was just to feel normal. Cause, uh, I mean, at the time I like, again, I wasn't making a lot of money. 
I was I was hustling family members, uh, being shady with with promoters, getting deposits, and you know all kinds of look. I'll I'll you know do doing ungodly things. Not you know I mean not doing sex things or anything like that. But I'd be like, look, I'll come in. You know, you send me a hundred bucks now. I'll throw a hundred bucks off my price. You know, to get the money up front for you know for my fix for the day. So it was uh, four or five times uh, a day. You know, and uh, you know it was a hundred dollar a day habit for two people now. You know, because my wife was unfortunately uh, in the train too. So it, it just became a real and and trying to you know, and it's it, I shouldn't say you know you got to be careful what I say these days, but to have uh, young you know, and I sound like I don't want to sound like the father of the year, but you're covering this all up like this doesn't sound the train wreck that I'm giving you isn't all unfolding uh, out in the open. This is all being hidden. Um, you know what I'm saying? It's very well. It's what How long we thought did that was last? Well. Um, years, years, Steve. Years, six, seven years at least. You know, and it was torturous to, 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 to compose yourself. There would be so many missed days, and uh, you know, and you know, you never, you can never show that you were less than or sick and of course if you know the kids would notice though when you're off you know because you're you know why is mom throwing up why is dad throwing up um why is he sick today so it really got to that point of a uh, you know something had to be done man but that went on we tried to because then you get to it you're you're shameful you're scared you're just trying to hold that ship together you know, wanting to get off, but how do you get off and who do you ask for help and how do you ask for help, man? It was, uh, I, I, I wouldn't wish it on, uh, well, I'm a worst enemy. I really would. It's, well, it's I, nothing, man. How did you Great. ride it so well? I didn't really, I don't think. I mean, I think everybody at that period, anybody that dealt with me, okay. probably you, in my head, I probably thought, you know, I'm getting away, I'm getting over on you, but hell i mean you had to know if i'm asking you know what i mean if i'm going through you know five six hundred dollars uh you know and i'm a regular guy with you know no no lavish stuff you know i got a little you know an apartment and stuff you know if i'm going through five hundred six hundred dollars in a couple of days where's that going um, what are y'all doing for groceries at this time bj oh just uh you know hitting up our family members i would i would do i would work as much as i could it's like you know kitchen work that's when i got into the culinary thing just trying to get anything to to get by it was it was a nightmare brother it was i pawned pretty much everything i owned anything of any value it was it was horrible it was uh you know real real low um low stuff you know real low stuff and it's it's just being honest you know and it's okay to say today because it's so far in the rear view mirror that it's okay to say today you know and even saying it to myself and saying it to you it's starting to make me a little sick like wow damn that was uh you know when you remove yourself for a little bit you could see that it's like wow that was rough you know some rough stuff but when you come out you get clean everything's fine and dandy and then how long ago was this relapse and the relapse was with was with alcohol correct yes it was um man you know it's nine, nine uh, days ago a, uh yeah it was it was uh december 15th so what uh, happens, was the day dude, when you relapse what's what what's what's going on basically man it's it's look, it, it for me again and i think you touched on it perfectly i think for myself and everybody's different but for me, it's a mental health issue. I think it's a depression thing where, you know, like when I'm on a roll, like right now, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here hitting up a podcast with you. I got this thing with, uh, you know, a good thing came out of this with the movie. Positive things happen. I'm working. I'm, I feel like I'm back in the community. I'm doing well. I'm okay. But then, you know, that thing where you're, you know, well, maybe I could just shit. I want to, you know, it's a good day to drink. It's a sunny day. Let's celebrate. Let's, you know, anything want, you know, that disease is always there trying to rear its ugly head. And I was like, well, I had a show, you know, I was like, well, nobody's going to know. I'll just take a couple of pops and, you know, nobody, again, you try to hide it. Nobody's going to know. And of course, everybody's going to know because when I drink, I don't, you know, I drink and, and I drink a lot and I, and I can't cover that up. And I made a fool of myself and, uh, you know, but uh, it comes down to, 
just really not being strong at that date. And that's why they say to stay vigilant and do the meetings and all that gimmick. And it sounds, man, brutally cliche in black and white, but it's a Brian, Brian Armstrong, man, road dog. He said, it. just keep it as simple. He goes, PJ, he goes, I was, I was in such a bad place. He goes, I could do it. And he, any person can do it. Just keep it simple. And you know, if you need help, ask for it. Don't be afraid. Cause we, as men aren't, you know, we're not used to going to other people and say, Hey man, my feelings, I feel this today. Right. You know what I mean? And that's really what is asked of you in this program to keep you sober is not to uh, do what we do so well, keep it bottled up, you know, and I bottled up a lot of stuff, man. I got so much stuff. Even the, the shrink said, kid, you got so much bottled up stuff in your head that you got to let it out. And, you know, there's professionals for all that groups and all that, but, you know, and it sounds whiny. And I hate to sound that, but to sound that way, but really to people that aren't familiar with it, to me, it's like second nature now, but for people that aren't familiar with it, it really is. Uh, I think it starts with mental health. You know, uh, I knew a cat, uh, and I, I don't know if you knew him personally. I knew him personally just a little bit, uh, Chester Bennington from Lincoln park. I was uh, with him, uh, about a year and a half ago and uh, he committed suicide. And he was clean for a while. Um, he was into drugs and stuff, you know, big time, had everything together, uh, loved his family, you know, had everything going for him. And, uh, you know, hung himself in a, in a hotel room, you know, and and I think it's a stigma of saying, I think, for our, for guys that we need help, that reaching out thing. I think it's like uh, it's still looked upon as you're weak, you're different somehow, you know. Um, and it, and it's hard to, to come across and to say, you know, cause the, nobody wants to be different. Nobody wants to be like, Oh, there's, there's PJ that, you know what I mean? You, you, you always want to be just regular guy. And unfortunately a lot of us that suffer from this disease, we're not that regular guy, you know, so not, what, what do you do there. when you go on a bender and you did 90 days ago? Uh, and so do you have a come to Jesus meeting with yourself? Did you say to your wife, Hey man, I effed up or do you, oh, yeah. what, what do you do? I mean, cause you, you know, I would imagine mentally you feel like you've let yourself down because you've reached a place that you never wanted to go back to. How do you deal with that? And, and how do you get back on the horse to go back to more strength, stringing up more days of sobriety? You being on day 90, give or take right right now. Yeah, really is that Jesus moment. Come to Jesus moment with yourself. Um, it, it, you got to say to yourself, dude, what the hell do you want with your life? You know, it, it gets to that point. It's like, do you what, know what you do want? you want? No, I don't. I know I don't want to live that way. And uh, I know I don't want to be that guy. But unfortunately, that guy is a part of me. And it sounds real cryptic. And uh, right now, today, in this past couple weeks have been actually a blessing. I've been in a really good place. But man, there's, 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 there's hits and misses. Sometimes it's not even a day at a time. Sometimes it's an hour at a time for me. You know, that's why when I said about this movie and this whole thing we're doing, man, every day is really, I don't know where this is going to end up. You know what I mean? I really don't. And it sounds like, okay, this is a bunch of, this will work as all. But I truly, I, I know I don't want to be like that. Um, but it's, you know, it really has to do with how you feel about yourself on a day-to-day -day basis to move forward. So that's it, man. It's, it's plain and simple for me. I know if I'm, if I drink, I'm going to screw up everything. Everything around me is going to fall and crumble and I'm going to end up being, you know, I'm either going to be dead or I'm going to, you know, be completely ostracized from the people I love and the, the people that love me. And that's it. And I just have to really keep that um, as black and white as I can and move forward. I think staying busy. And uh, like I said, man, that relapse was a blessing in disguise, having DDP call me and uh, kind of, you know, giving to me because he's awesome, dude. He's, uh, sometimes he's a little too much. I must say, uh, I love Dallas to death, but uh, he's, he is an inspiration in some ways, man. Sometimes you need that little kick in the ass uh, to get you going. And he knows just what to say to me. And uh, he don't he don't know me from, you know, he don't owe me nothing, man. And he, he pick up the phone he'll stay on the phone with me for hours jake does the same thing man and uh you know they're they're actually jake scott and uh dallas are, are, are you know they shot pieces for it already uh we did this convention at the old ecw arena uh a month ago and we got them on camera um just like kind of over dinner 
um, which is pretty cool. Uh, a lot of cool stuff there. But how uh, was that? Was that a oh. trigger? I mean, dude, there were so many drugs in that building. I was there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for, for just a brief moment, but I mean, oh, man, I there's know. so many guys from that crew are gone, as guys from every crew, WCW, WWF, ECW, and, and the other places. But man, a lot of the and dude, that was that was a hell of a culture over there. It was it was a hell of a culture, and and, and it was it wasn't as much of a trigger because it has changed so much. It isn't that same. I I know you. I don't think you've been back there since it's changed over. Now it's more like a multimedia center where it looks like a legitimate place of business. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? They have like big screens and a nice little fancy uh, restaurant bar area, flat screens all over. You know, it ain't that old place it used to be, but uh, man, the triggers were, it, I mean, brother, it was, uh, you know, I talk about it to me like it was the glory days. Cause it was like, punk rock revolution if people are into rock and roll music which i am i'm an old school rock and roll guy it was what punk rock was it was something different i felt it was uh i certainly wasn't in the start of it in the uh, early stages with you know guys like you brian terry funk Mick Foley, uh shane tommy and sandman and them cats but just being part of that you know what i mean that was I, I was that was just right for me you know what i mean i got to perform my craft fans that respected the business i thought i mean a little bit you know we, we it was the ultimate work too over there i just figured out how to work those guys because it was all work yes you know what i mean you just figure out the work you know it was actually it's actually much harder to get over in wwe i thought the opposite i thought oh if you can get over in ecw you can get no it was just easy you just wear the flag that they want you know the rebellion bullshit you know against corporate whatever you know what i mean yeah. it's a lot harder it's a lot harder to get over in wwe <laughs> than anywhere else and you know that's the tester but you know it was perfect for me it was a great little testament in my life and i wouldn't change it but i can't live there anymore you know i was a good hand i did what i did and i it's hard my, my hardest part steve is hanging on because just about when i'm ready to say you know what the business and i know physically from a wrestling standpoint i know i have nothing left in the tank to go and wrestle on a, any, anywhere near a, a schedule. That's not what I want. But, you know, this is all I know. This is all I've put my heart and energy since I was 15, 16 years old into. So that's my biggest trigger in life is how do I either detach myself completely or get, in, you know, every time, every time I think I'm out, they pull, you know, it's like that old Godfather line. Every time I think I'm out, they pull me back in with some little thing. You know, oh, we got this little thing for you, this little, just enough. And I just need to either, I'm all or nothing all the way in life. I'm, I'm, I go to the extremes in anything. And that's not good way to live, uh, period. But I need to be in or out. And hopefully this little piece that I'm doing right now will put some little closure. I'll make a little bunny, you know, put a little bread in my pocket and move into something else i just don't know what that something else could be unfortunately that's yeah, well, what that's about a, the culinary stuff you're talking about man there's no you know i'm good at it but there's just no money in it and that's a whole different podcast but there's just uh there's so many guys and we're getting down there I mean, and it's really not competitive uh and able to to really you know what i'm saying like it really you. takes you got to be good man and i'm just not there at uh you know what i mean it's like i need to make a little bit you know, I, I need to make my nuts a certain amount of money to, you know, and I, I just can't do that uh, by myself. But do you uh, have any that. idea of the next step? Brother, I don't. No, I don't. I really don't. And I, it's not for lack of trying. Is that, is that something that you rack your brain with, with your wife? Do you guys say, hey, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, we, we, we've tried many attempts at little things here or there that have failed. Uh, because it's like, you know, dude, nobody prepares you. There's no manual for this stuff. I never thought. I was going to make it in this business, right? So this was all, you know, this to me this is all gravy, right? I never thought I was going to get a gig at 19, 20 years old with the with the with, with, with New York, you know. So to me this is all gravy, but it's also been a, it's such a cool thing and an amazing thing and you get, you know, kind of my life revolved around it for so many years and uh and you know, it, it is embarrassing when you are uh, I mean, I have had to take third shift jobs at Target stacking shelves where people are like, yo, uh, aren't you just incredible? Why are you doing this? And I mean, I know I'm not, you know, Steve Austin or, you know, guys that would get noticed on a regular basis, but especially in the Northeast, there's some guys that 
do know who I am and they do see you. And it's a, it, it comes to you and it kind of kicks you right when you're okay with something and you're cool with it. It kicks you right in the, the cone, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> God damn. Yeah. I was just, you know what I mean? And then you do an indie gig. I, I'll never forget it, dude. I was wrestling Shane Douglas in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania a couple of years ago. And I just came off and of working some third shift at Target. And just, again, trying to keep it honest, brother. You know, making money, you know, whatever, uh, anything I can to support my family. You know, and I, some mark in the front row, hey, incredible, you suck. Why don't you go back to work at Target, you piece of, you know what? You know, and I'm like, oh, boy. <laughs> You're, you know what I mean? And that just eats you up, you know. And, of course, I got it. Like, I don't have enough mental health issues, right? I need to be hearing this. But anyways, I digress, Steve. I, I digress. So what, what are you guys thinking this documentary is going to come out? Yeah, um, we, we, we're we looking to have everything wrapped up uh, by the end of spring. I would say June. It's going to be packaged pretty, you know, the, the executive producer, David Gear. He worked actually recently with uh, Kevin Nash, Tom Sizemore, Chuck Zito. I'm actually doing a movie with him and Don Johnson called The Vault. I actually am a... A prison inmate, and I get a get a put over Chuck Zito in a fight. I'm not taking a, you know, I'm not. It's not like it, it's just, this stuff just landed in my lap. I'm not. That's not where I'm headed uh, in my life. I don't think I'd be any good at it. But uh, just for fun and shits and giggles, because he's the guy that's uh, doing this project with me, the documentary. So I'm doing that. But um, I think what we're trying to do to bookend this, because most of this I've, I've come to realize is going to be done, and you've worked, you know, with reality TV as well, uh, is going to be done in post. I think we're just going to end up bookending it with, uh, you know, the promotion I screwed up for uh, that made a big deal that went viral that I was all messed up. You know, I'm in good shape. I've been working out, doing the DDP stuff. I'm going to be going to Atlanta, uh, staying with Dallas at his crib for a little bit. Um, I'm in great shape. That's one thing. And kind of coming through that curtain and saying, look, I don't know what the narrative is going to be, but it's not like, hey, I'm coming back to, you know, I'm not going, you know, it's not one of those things. It's like, look, my life is getting better. This is my journey. It's just more of a story being told of, of what the hell happened, you know, and to me. And it's a, I think it's a, but it's an everyday, it's an every wrestler thing. I think more wrestlers go through this than people realize that journey, that real oh, raw dude, journey. I'm with you 100% on that. But hey, before you, know, you got into business, and I know you were a lifelong fan of the business, but was there ever anything else you wanted to do with your life other than wrestle? No. <laughs> No, you know, and it, it, it's, it's, you know, what's the hardest, you know, this is, this is what is the hardest is I, and, and I, and it's not, I, I, I come from blue. My dad worked 50, 60 hours in a factory. My mom did two blue collar people all the way. Um, but I work, you know, sometimes 40 hours for 300 bucks when some guy will, you know, I'll make that for going out there and taking a walk around the building in a pair of jean shorts and an ECW shirt or something, you know, give me five, six, you know what I mean? And it's like, it's like, wow, if there's a way, and there's, I mean, there's enough balance today in this business where you can be viable with social media, with the way I think the business is kind of coming into a little bit of a renaissance. There's a lot of places to work these days. It ain't what it used to be when everything came crashing down and uh, Vince kind of gobbled everything up. There's a lot of good places to work, especially internationally. Oh, over in England, they got a lot of strong stuff, a lot of good indies over here. You know, so a lot of young kids, too, a lot of good talent, hungry kids. Uh, so there's a lot out there, man. I, and I think my thing would be, I mean, the wrestling school thing would never work because so many guys got their hands in that. And it's such a work. I think that is the biggest work in the world. Um, you got kids don't get broken and right and they get robbed of their money. And, you know, I, I, when I broke in with the hearts, dude, they literally 12 started to finished and it would basically work you out to see if you would even be able to physically make it in there. You know what I mean? They try to get you out of there by making you do X amount of squats, X amount of push-ups, and hit the ropes and taking bumps before you even did anything. Nowadays, they just take your money and, you know, everybody's a wrestler. Everybody's a worker, you know? So, uh, but I would love to be able to pass down some of the knowledge because, man, I'm one, of the, I'm one of the guys that got the privilege, I think, to work with guys like like yourself, like the Kurt Hennings, like the Shawn Michaels, and to be around so many guys, like that transition from old school to the new school. You know, I was I was there when Daniel Bryan was in Shawn's camp in 99 in uh, San Antonio. I saw Daniel Bryan come up. I mean, I, there's, there's something I can't offer this business. I just don't know what it is from a, whether it's helping kids out or, or doing something. There's, there's gotta be something for me in the business to at least for fun, because I do still love this damn thing. That's what kills me as I do love it. 
Um, and hopefully I, I could find my little niche somewhere, you know, and that's, that's really my goal. But my long-term goal as a family, man, right now is just, uh, Hell, I, I mean, it sounds bad, but maybe go back to school for something and, and, and do this as, as a in a little side gig and see what happens, you know? Hell, when I saw this movie on Netflix, I should get something. I'm getting points on this damn thing, so we'll see what happens. Well, congrats on a movie. Uh, what what kind know? of bookings you got coming up? I mean, and how many bookings are you are, are you trying to stay real busy within the squared circle or, or doing whatever you're doing at the, at the events? Uh, I'm trying to do as many, like, I try to do, like, the least amount of wrestling possible. Um, I am doing some. I'm doing, uh, my next gig is, uh, I'm doing the WrestleMania weekend. Uh, like, I think every everybody in the business is going to be in New Orleans uh, that weekend. I'll be down there at WrestleCon, uh, I, I believe it's the 6th through the 8th, if I'm not mistaken. I just got booked for that yesterday, as a matter of fact. And uh, I got a show in New Hampshire uh, coming up on the 21st. So, not a whole heck of a lot, you know what I mean? I do... Uh, I do little things here or there, nothing big time. So, uh, but that's my pretty much my my next gig, and uh, you know, just uh, pretty much now is just finishing this gig up, going to Dallas's, um, and uh, you know, pretty much my Twitter thing is uh, is how we all communicate these days. You know, get our brand, our brands. We're brands now, you know, <laughs> but uh, it's actually quite useful. You know, you get your stuff out there, and uh, if anybody's interested in anything I'm doing, man, go over to Twitter, check out uh, at PJ Polacco. It'll pretty much leads you anywhere. Credible document com over to the website uh new york post actually picked it up too the story so it's getting a little bit of steam and we just hope that enough people you know uh, it's going to be a positive spin hopefully on this and hopefully it is a a redemption story the, the name of the movie is credible recover redemption and recovery and hopefully that's what it's about that's what it'll end up being you know it's kind of on me to see where it ends up so we will see you know, I know you're doing some uh, independent bookings, so you're still active, but in, in a way, you're somewhat retired. When you look back at your career in the squared circle, the highs, lows, the whole journey, when you look back at your career, what are your thoughts? Are you happy with yourself? Are you disappointed? Could there have been more? Or, I mean, uh, what, what are your feelings? Yeah. Huge disappointment. Huge how, how disappointment. So? Man, I, cause, yeah, I don't know how to say it, but, you know, and, and just bear with me here, but I feel it was a huge disappointment because drugs and alcohol, if that was not involved, it would have leveled the playing field, at least for me. I would have been um, – I don't think I was ever made out to be um, – I was never that alpha male. You know, uh, you, you man, you got to be special to be up there. Um, you're, you, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have to sit here and, you know, we've known each other a long time. You are special. Certain guys are special. I never thought I could be special like that. I knew that I knew my limitations, but I could have been, you know, that good tag team guy, that good middle guy that could get guys over guy could have a good match with anybody guy. Um, I had my taste in ECW and it was so much fun because at the end of the day, it was like back, I, I related to the AWA, you know, it was that third promotion. We were doing live, live pay-per-views. I was headlining those gigs and those weren't, you know, putting three, four, 5,000 people in seats and doing live TV and then, and, and doing the gig. And I, I felt like if I would have been together mentally and more of a grown, mature man, when I had made the leap in 2001, uh, when ECW closed and WCW closed. But then again, you know, again, I always say it, you had so much talent and that invasion thing and so many people pecking at that's, you know, it was, it was so hard, but I got, you know, you get lost in the shuffle, but it was my, I think there would was my fault. Uh, if I was a little more head in the game and been more assertive physically, mentally, and not been so scared. And, uh, you know, I was, I was so worried about being liked by everybody that I never made the right business moves as a businessman in the ring. Um, you know, I was a yes man, you know, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Whatever you want to do. Never worrying about how am I going to get over? I worried about how you're going to get over. And unfortunately in the business, that's how it is. You got to take care of you though, too. Um, and I was, I, I always came for, in ECW. We took care of each other. WWE, right. it wasn't like that. You know what I'm saying? Like Paul Heyman would take care of everybody because we really, it wasn't, you're getting over ECW. Paul was smart. ECW was getting over, not the individual. I thought people would just, you know, I'll do good for you. You do good for me. And I never were, you know, it's not like that. And that's cool. I understand that going in, but it was my fault. So I, I have a problem with that for me, my lack of, of going for it, I guess. Like yeah, Vince said. Yeah, but you, but you were in the business for a long time. How, how long? Okay. Let's, let's, let's just stop on what you're doing now. How, how long have you been in the ring? Uh, 24 years. 
Dude, that's a long-ass run. Dude, I enjoyed working with you every time we worked, especially those 10 shows going back in the day. And, dude, I, I always say this, but, and it's true. You were an integral part of me getting over, me getting a chance to do color commentary, doing the, doing the match where I tried to get you to forfeit it. And, of course, you know, I end up stomping yep. you, and, you know, you, you helped me out. But, man, if you hadn't come along w with the kind of material that you were able to present me with, you know, hell, I don't know what I would have said. So, like I said, I, I always enjoyed working with you. And... and you really helped fuel the beginning of Stone Cold, and I've always appreciated that. Oh, I know you do, and that means a lot, but that's what I, but to me, that's cool too for me. You know what I'm saying? Like, look, not everybody's going to be Stallone. Or, you know what I mean, the leading man. I get it. You know, I just felt like if I played my cards right, I could have still been a, a guy to help get somebody over. You know, that's what I really wish I would have played my cards differently. You know what I mean? If I was a little more responsible. Because I, I was able to, uh, you know, I, I a lot of people don't notice. I was Batista's first match. I was Randy Orton's first match on TV coming out of Louisville before uh, they did they the NXT. Why. Right. Uh, CM Punk. His first match was with me coming in 2006. I was, you know, I, I was good. And that was cool. I was good with that. You know, not everybody's, uh, you know, the main player. Not everybody's the big star. And that's cool. And I understood that. Uh, I just wish I would have handled my, my end of the, of the deal. Again, it's not anybody's fault. It's my fault. I wish I would have presented myself and handled myself and took care of my business better. But, hey. You live and you learn, and, and hopefully I can pass it down, man. You know, to some young cats coming up. It's all I can do, and, and I, I still love the business. I still love. Uh, Dude, you still got a good head on your shoulders, and you damn sure know the business inside and out. I enjoy listening to your take. I've seen some of your videos on YouTube. You, you got a real good take on what's going on in the business and what needs to go on inside the squared circle. From a physicality uh, question, being 24 years in the business, how's your body feeling? Not too bad, man. Not too bad. I'm, I'm, I'm my left shoulder is pretty banged up. Uh, it's gonna probably need to get some. Uh, my rotator cuff uh, probably need to get some work done real soon. I've been holding that off for a while. You know, I haven't been lifting weights. I have been. Again, it's not a. It's not simply to put over the DDP yoga stuff, but really, I have been doing it because uh, my shoulder's in bad shape and I could barely. Uh, you know, I have a very little lateral movement. But on my legs, God bless, man. I still got my legs. My knees are okay. My low back has been okay. Um, I lost some weight. I actually got, you know, I'm starting to get my abs back a little bit. Um, I, I feel okay, man, from a physicality standpoint. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I couldn't run, like, you know, a full-time schedule anymore at 44 years of age. You only have so many bumps on your bump card. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But uh, I, I, I certainly, uh, you know... I, I could do it once in a while. And I enjoy, I do, man. There's nothing like going out there, even if it's in front of a couple hundred people. And uh, I, I love just calling it out there because, you know, and so many kids are afraid of that these days, dude. And I never understood that. Like, I love, I, that's one of the things you taught me in the early days because we had those fun tent kind of atmosphere towns where, hell, I didn't know if it was going to be a kick or a stunner. Or we were going to do, like you did that time, one time with the damn suplexes, the 10 suplexes, you know, from corner to corner with Jake Roberts, you know what I mean? Like, you never knew what you were going to get, but that's how the business was, and that was what was fun. It's like a tapestry. It's like, what, 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 paint, what picture are we going to paint tonight? And kids these days, man, you know, I'm happy because in some ways they don't get the part, you know, they don't party as much, and the drugs are really not there the way they used to be, and that's great. The business has cleaned up. But uh, the, there's no fun in it anymore for a lot of these kids. A lot of these guys are so, uh, man, they just they don't know how to enjoy the fruits of their labor, you know, and really be out there and have a good time with it. And that's that's what I miss is that camaraderie that and I think a lot of the guys say that is being with the boys, being in that, you know, in the squared circle, being in the locker room, that that whole unity thing. As much as it is an individualistic business, it is a very much uh, communal thing when uh, when it's, you know, when you're one of the boys. So how is it for I do you, miss that. How is it for you when the bell rings and the match starts? Are you back in uh, like a kid in a candy store? Are you in heaven? Or, oh, or, or, yeah. or are you thinking, hey, man, this is cool, but, you know, I'm 44 and I'm post prime. Where's your head at? See, that's where I, it, it's. It, I'm right. I'm right back in there, and that's that's one thing. And I I used to watch you, and I, I got a lot. From, I learned a lot from you, man. And I never you know put it over. But you know, you 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 were so intense, and you got into that zone. You know, right before your music hit, and you went out through the curtain, and um, you know, and I just pretty much I it's it, I get in the zone. I go out there, and I know my limitations now. You know, I know what I'm capable of and what I'm not capable or willing to do <laughs> these days. But, heck, I, I have a bag of tricks now, you know what I mean, that I know I can go to. I got four or five things I know I could still do that are going to ooh and out of people anytime. 
I could just, you know, I could just basically say reverse, you know, and I could do something. And uh, I got a little bag of tricks, and I, I, I could just, you know, for me, a little, a little, a little flare steamboat punch kick chop, <laughs> a couple of little things in there, man, a little, you know, a couple ducks and dives, and then you're good. I still, that's that part to me is so much fun. That's the that's the drug, the addiction of it. It, it. it is so cool, and it's not rocket science, man. Some of the best matches I had were with a, a guy named Jerry Lynn and uh, Steve Carino. Oh yeah, and uh, man, we just go out there and in three ways. I hate three ways. I did we, had, we did we did a bunch of three ways for the title on live pay per view, man. We had a bunch of time, and a lot of them, I mean, they were all good, but you know, you end up shit canning one of them, and we're mm. really working one on one with the other guy. Yeah. But a lot of the stuff, dude, we were just doing flare steamboat. We didn't call anything back there. We, if you look at it, it's just chop back and forth. I do the flippy, go outside, you know, sunset flip, do the bridge, backslide, you know, some of that simple stuff that was uh, so cool. I mean, we literally, we had code names for stuff. You know what I'm saying? I'd be like, you know, reverse, I'll do the, the you know, the, the whirly bird into the deal, into the flare, into the Sean, or into the, you know, stunner. I mean, we're doing everything. <laughs> So I miss that. It's that being out there in that uh, spontaneity. I miss. I, I really do miss. I'm just that, glad that's to hear cool. you still enjoy being in the ring. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I, I'm not trying to get those kablams or anything like that. Uh, I'm more of a up, uh, upright fighter <laughs> these days. Well, dude, at this stage of the game, like you said, with a full bump card, you got to work smarter, not harder. <laughs> Yeah, and if you didn't, if you didn't learn anything as far as psychology goes, and you're still doing the hardest stuff available to you, then you know, yeah. that, that that's not good. But no, you're right. a guy that, that picked up the mental aspects of the game. Yeah, and I, and I knew I got there when uh when one time Bob Holly uh, and I were working, and uh, it was actually him. God rest his soul, crash was putting over a X Pac and myself. And it was on Raw or something like that. And Bob wanted to do, uh, you know, that Alabama slam thing. Oh yeah, that hala- that thing is hellacious. And I've I've had a, I mean, I've got I've had a history of concussions, like bad. I've had a, at least ten of them, at least. And I said, Bob, look, that's not the finisher of the match. I said, I'm not, you know. And Bob's a tough guy, and I always got along with him, you know. But uh, I said, look, I'll take it, but I might not get up. <laughs> you know, that's not the finish. You know, I might not get up from it. <laughs> so you know, I got to express myself a little more when like you know like look dude that's just not for me anymore and even then I, I i started to be able to feel comfortable but also to say it in a way that wasn't like i'm not doing it because right. then you you know how that goes like a fart in church sometimes you know what i mean <laughs> but uh i was very careful and, and said look dude i'll take it i just it's live tv i just may not get up from it and i was being honest too you know it wasn't that i wasn't willing to it's just i so I'm not, take that <laughs> Uh, we did something else. We did something actually really easy out of it. And uh, didn't, you know what I mean? Sometimes, man, um, it's just a matter of trying with some guys, uh, you know, and I was always like, I'll do anything you want. Worst thing ever. Don't ever tell anybody you'll do anything. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> they, you, you, dude, because I never did that. You know what I mean? It's like I always took into consideration, you know, okay, my finish has got to be something that I could hit on every guy. The people aren't going to boo-boo face if they're going to have to take it. You know, stunner was the perfect finish, super kick, stuff like that, because you could hit it on anybody. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And it's not a hard thing to uh, – you know what I'm saying? It's not like you're asking somebody to do the – and, uh, of course, it was all hail the dead man, but that big old thing he does, I don't know what you even call it, that thing uh, where he jacks you up uh, by the trunks there. Oh, and, yeah. The last ride. Uh, oh, my God. I mean, in my march – greatest of all time one of the greatest of all time I, i've taken it before he, he takes care of you but still that just the the height he's a tall man <laughs> that's no joke brother <laughs> you know you can you can stun me cut me super kick me all day long that's cool you know we're good but anyways i digress before i get myself in trouble like no luckily i never had to take that i you know lots of choke slams uh stuff like yes. that and i know they're easy because he'd float yes. you down and, and he really took care of you on the way down but anyway hey man one more time uh pj before we ride off in the sunset it was awesome catching up to you and uh, i wish you the best in the 90 days here on and, yes 
yes, sir. keeping it together. Uh, but tell people uh, where you're at on social media and tell them about the, the incredible documentary. Absolutely. I'll do it real quick, man. Um, mostly I do, uh, I do Twitter. So hit me up at PJ Polacco. You'll have everything for the incredible documentary. Also, if you're interested in the movie, the trailer's on my uh, on the Twitter page. But uh, go to CredibleDocumentary.com and everything else, Instagram, Facebook, PJ Polacco, same thing on YouTube, PJ Polacco, YouTube, just incredible, all good. You know, one one name fits all for that because I don't own just incredible, unfortunately. Some rap star, do you believe some rapper took that damn thing from me? Are you ribbing me? No, some rapper took just incredible. I thought Vince owned it. I went to copyright the damn thing and uh, it <laughs> finally got the money up, pointed up the money and some rapper out in LA has, uh, or DJ has the name just incredible. So, yeah, go figure that one. What a mark. Yeah, well, you know, that's that's, that's what happens. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole different podcast. Well, God dang, <laughs> man. Hey, it was awesome talking to you, man, and good luck. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, you know, I, it sounds cliche to say stay strong, but I hope you stay strong. Yeah, man, it, it, it is, and I thank you. It means a lot. And, uh, you know, just doing stuff like this, reminiscing, puts a big smile on my face. And if anything, then... Um, I got from this. I just want to share this journey. It's important because if, if some person, some young bug coming up, you know, it's like, I hate to be that guy, but don't do what I did kind of a thing. You know, it's like the groundwork is laid out for what works for you young guys out there, you know, um, and we don't need any more casualties of, uh, of our war, you know, and uh, I hope uh, it stops there, you know. I think things like this are always good, and certainly, man, yeah, there needs to be some good examples, and there are, like this with the with the Jake Roberts story, and Scott was kind yeah. of included in that, and I'm looking forward to seeing your story, because, I mean, yeah. man, I tell you what, whether it's the business of pro wrestling, the show business, any kind of business, if you're around any kind of element, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble, so, yes, again, it, it doesn't necessarily, in your case, it pertains to pro wrestling, but it, it, could, but it's, it, right. it, it fits across the board anywhere in life. You're absolutely right. It could be anything. So it's it's totally relatable, like you said, all across the board, man. Absolutely, dude. Absolutely. Dude, good talking to you. Wish you nothing but the best. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Steve. It's always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you. Every Monday, get your weekly dose of Jay Moore on more stories. This week's guest, Heather Graham. You know, roller girl. Who's your favorite Muppet? Like from Sesame Street all the way up Kermit. To... All right. Front man. Yeah. Good. Why are there so many songs about rainbows? Amazing. Well, it's, it's such a good song, right? It really is. Yeah. Jim Henson's probably like the greatest actor that ever lived. Make sure you subscribe to more stories exclusively on Apple Podcasts, PodcastOne.com, or the new Podcast One app. Don't forget to rate, review, and leave a five-star rating. All right, everybody, give me a go-home cues. I'm going to wrap up this podcast and ride off in the sunset. Before I do that, I want to thank my guest, PJ Polacco, just incredible, for coming out here and dropping some 411 on all the things he's going through. I'm looking forward to seeing the documentary Credible as soon as it comes out. And we'll do another podcast probably, you know, once I'm able to see that thing. But it's a great time talking to PJ. I appreciate him being so honest and candid with a lot of things that he shared with me today. So check it out. I enjoyed talking with you, PJ, and I wish you all the best. Hey, man, ProWrestlingTees.com forward slash Steve Austin has all my Broken Skull Ranch t-shirts. You can check them out there. Best damn IPA on the planet. No doubt, hands down, Broken Skull IPA from El Segundo Brewing Company. And if you live in Cali, we're at Whole Foods and Total Wines. And if you ain't in Cali, check inside the cellar.com and see if they ship to your state. And if you're looking to get a badass pocket knife, which I suggest every single person have, check out either the Cold Steel Broken Skull Knife or the new Cold Steel Working Man's Knife, and you can get them at my new Amazon store. Amazon has the best price on both knives. Just go to Amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash Steve Austin. And I got to say one more thank you to all the fine sponsors of the Steve Austin Show. That's how I'm able to do this podcast for you twice a week for free. Find all my sponsors at PodcastOne.com. Just click on the Killer Deals button at the top of the page and then click on the Steve Austin Show banner. Hey, folks, I am on social media, Twitter and Instagram at Steve Austin BSR. And once again, I will be appearing at RussellCon April 7th and April 8th. And you can go to RussellCon.com and check out the signing times and all that other stuff. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody. I rarely do personal appearances, so I'm looking forward to going down to New Orleans for two days, signing autographs, meeting people, shaking hands, smiling, taking pictures, 
and then jump on that airplane and head back to the main streets of Los Angeles, and then I'm heading out to Nevada, where I'm taking my Kawasaki Brute 4 750 on an extended mission, and I am going to ride the living the hell out of that thing and put about 500 miles on it. Keep posted. I'll tell you about my trip. Folks, until next time, my name is Steve Austin, and I will catch your ass down the road. This has been a Podcast One production. Download new episodes of The Steve Austin Show every Tuesday at podcastone.com. That's podcastone.com. A Baton Rouge police officer fired for the Alton Sterling shooting. I'm Jackie Quinn with an AP News Minute. The police chief in Baton Rouge announces the firing of one officer and the suspension of another involved in the fight and deadly shooting two years ago of Alton Sterling. Sterling's family's lawyer says it's time for the federal government to work to stop these police shootings. They give local police departments tanks, tear gas, pepper spray, any equipment that they need from the federal government, why can't they get involved in this epidemic? Police say that they still don't have a motive for the shooting death of a police officer in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. The suspect was shot and killed by officers early this morning. More than 15 Palestinian demonstrators reported killed in clashes with Israeli troops. U.N. Representative Riyad Mansour. It is a huge massacre against our people, which we condemn in the strongest terms. The U.N. Security Council called an emergency meeting. This is AP Radio News. I'm Jack.